Let's start with the news, certainly, that, of course, is being heard around the world. Reaction to that accusation by Trudeau uh, and India's subsequent response about the involvement uh, from India in the killing of a B.C. Sikh leader. Well, I think it's an appalling development. Uh, it's an attack not just on Mr. Nijar, but an attack on Canada's sovereignty. It's particularly galling when the country at issue is a long, long-standing friend of Canada. We've had our ups and downs with India, but fundamentally, we've always liked India, and I think India always liked Canada. So this is going to set back our relations for a while. Now, in terms of the credibility of this evidence, of this intelligence that is being brought forward, you know, what sort of standard or bar needs to be reached for it to be at the point for the prime minister to make an announcement like this, given those real implications that we've continued to discuss on the world stage? Well, I think they have to be pretty convincing. A uh, couple of points. One, we're not dealing, though, with the criminal law standard of beyond any reasonable doubt. That's an entirely different issue that the province of British Columbia and the RCMP are going to have to deal with in the murder investigation. But in matters dealing with national security, uh, I think you have to, the national security agencies have to be satisfied in a practical sense that they have enough evidence. They have to convince ministers. In this, this instance, I gather that we have been sharing some of this intelligence with our closest allies. If there had been some doubt about the, the credibility of that information, there would have been a pushback. And I gather there has not been any such pushback. And for the prime ministers to stand up formally in the House of Commons and to make this statement, I would say that the government would have to be very convinced that we're dealing with credi credible intelligence. You know, it's interesting because we heard remarks, too, from the Conservative Party leader, Pierre Poilievre, where he said, I want to see more details on this. He said, in terms of the risk to Canada, if there is any question about the credibility or if there's any complications on where things stand, he just simply said it could be real, and that is for certain. So I'm wondering what you make uh, of those questions surrounding what was really found here. Well, everybody always wants more information. Uh, certainly opposition parties do, and I understand that desire. But I think in this particular case, it's highly unlikely that the details of the investigation and anything surrounding the extrajudicial killing are going to be made public. Uh, it's simply not the way things are done in international relations. Um, you know, maybe eventually uh, there will be a commission of inquiry or Justice Hoag's inquiry will look into this and bid into the future. But I don't think the government is likely to be able to share much of this with Parliament. In terms now of the, the talks between the tensions between these two countries, we know that India has come out saying that these allegations are absurd and unfounded. And we've had our prime minister, Canada's prime minister, say there is credible evidence that India played a role in the killing of this Canadian. Uh, we know that there have been accusations uh, from, from India's prime minister uh, that Canada has been inactive, has been, has had inaction on Khalistani extremism within this country. And also during the course of the G20 summit, we saw very frosty tensions there. How does all of this play into what we're seeing right now? Well, first of all, no, no country likes to be accused by another country of having uh, organized an extrajudicial killing. No country talks about operational intelligence, even when the news is good news. So India's reaction is entirely understandable. They took the offensive and they're pushing back. That doesn't mean that they weren't involved. That doesn't mean they didn't know about it. Uh, to my mind, one of the key issues, which we may never resolve, are we dealing with a rogue agent, a rogue agency, or a rogue government that authorized this kind of, uh, this kind of extrajudicial uh, killing? Um, I think that this is going to frost relations between Canada and India for a little while. Uh, but I think we have to also recognize that India is there, India is important, and we're going to have to find a way eventually to move on beyond this. You know, I just remind us that there were several extrajudicial killings in the United Kingdom that the UK suggested had been uh, perpetrated by the Soviet Union. They didn't break diplomatic relations, they frosted relations, and eventually they kept on talking. The key to me is that with our allies, because alone we're not going to convince India of a great deal, with our close allies, convince them that there's a price to be paid for this so that they never do it again. What's happened has happened. Uh, I don't think, I agree entirely with the Prime Minister, Mr. LeBlanc, Ms. Jolly, 
when they ask for the cooperation of India into this inquiry, I don't think we're going to get it, even though it is proper that they should ask. If we can't solve this problem, this, this case in Canada, it's never going to get resolved to our full satisfaction. There's not going to be a criminal law case in, in BC, I think. The most we can hope for is continued work on the part of the RCMP and CSIS and others to try and find out as much as we can and then applying political and diplomatic pressure with our allies on India to make sure, A, there's a cost to this, and B, as I said, they never do this again. Certainly, this is a complicated issue, uh, not just on the world stage involving Canada and India relations, but also within this country, too, when we talk about uh, the communities involved. And I was talking about the reaction that we saw from the Conservative Party leader, and I also want to fold in some of the reaction that we had from the federal NDP leader, uh, Jagmeet Singh. He went on the platform uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, saying, I will leave no stone unturned in the pursuit of justice including holding Narendra Modi accountable, India's Prime Minister. Then we heard from our Prime Minister, Mr. Trudeau, who this morning said that Canada isn't looking to provoke or escalate tensions with India. Are these conflicting messages that we're hearing here? I think we have to be clear on one thing. There is nothing in Canada, there is no one in Canada that can hold Mr. Modi directly accountable unless the government of India decides for its own purposes that it wants to talk about this. The claim, the desire for accountability is entirely reasonable, but the basis for international relations is state sovereignty. India is as sovereign as we are, as other countries are. If they do not wish to be held accountable directly by admitting this or by dealing with us in our investigation, it is not going to happen. The only real levers that we have are, you know, recalling our high commissioner, postponing uh, visits, postponing trade agreements, making a point with our allies at the United Nations and elsewhere that this is an unacceptable way of dealing with this and perhaps to some degree embarrassing India enough uh, that they don't do this again. I think Mr. Singh's request for full accountability and no stone unturned is great, but nobody from the RCMP or anybody else is going to be allowed to go to India and interview people from the Indian intelligence services. So we, I think we have to be reasonable, do as much as we possibly can in Canada, but accept that the international system limits what we can do. And very finally, just a quick question for you in terms of what we heard from the World Sick Organization of Canada as they were speaking earlier uh, today. They said that within the community, they have been previously advised in some cases that there could be potential targets uh, by the Indian government. They have alleged that uh, and said that they would like more protections. How deeply has CSIS been looking into the prospect of interference by India to target specifically that community? I think they've been looking at it quite a bit for quite a number of years, and there's often reference to this issue in their annual reports. Uh, but there's a difference between what they discover, what they're being told by the Sikh community, and what the Indian government is saying. Um, I, I would say that the government of Canada has taken steps to protect that community and to deal with the, with the issues at hand. Have they done enough? I personally don't think they have done enough, and the Sikh community certainly don't think they've done enough. This may result in more activity taking place. But more broadly, I think there's a problem in this country with foreign interference writ large. And it has existed before Mr. Trudeau became prime minister. It has existed for a long time. Governments have dealt with it, but they haven't really taken it on as a major priority. I hope that this will incite them to do this. Not a problem that's unique to Canada, but the way the international environment is changing right now, this is not going to go away. So I think we may have to be more aggressive in Canada in monitoring representatives of other states and various communities to make sure that we can offer them protection. Because if a state can't do that and protect its own citizens, there's a fundamental issue.